welcome back to Guide Chat. My name is Paul. I'm a Ho Family student guide at the Harvard Art Museums. I'm Caitlin. I'm also a Ho Family student guide at the Harvard Art Museums. And today we're going to be talking about the more problematic, often unseen histories that are hidden within the Harvard Art Museums and also problems that most museums encounter at large. Yeah, so today, again, we'll be talking about a lot of the, the deeper issues that museums sometimes face that maybe are not always immediately obvious. And a big one that we'll be touching on is acquisition. How did objects come into museums? Sometimes this can be very contested, especially with ancient art. So if you're familiar with museums, you might know the example of the Parthenon marbles, these famous carvings that used to stand on the top of the Parthenon in Athens, Greece but these were removed in the 1800s and brought to England where they're now displayed in the British Museum as you see on the left here. And this brings up an issue of heritage. Basically, the modern country of Greece has made multiple demands for these beautiful carvings to be sent back. And the British Museum often maintains that the marbles are better off in England where many people can come and see them. And in fact, they're, they often sometimes argue that they're protecting them. So this is an issue that's very much in the news. That's a topic of continued debate. And there's quite a few pieces at the Harvard Art Museums that also have these sort of contested pasts, multiple claims to who should own them. And we'll be digging into that more in just a second. And here is just a close up of the Parthenon marbles as they're displayed in the British Museum. And from this picture, we kind of get a sense too that we don't see them in their full context. We don't see them on the top of the building in Greece where they would have originally been positioned. Instead, we just kind of see them against this plain stone wall. So that's another thing we'll be thinking about. How does museum display maybe detract from your ability to understand the way that an object was originally situated? Yeah, so now let's look at a Harvard specific example. So. Our journey first starts um, in Dunhuang, a city in northwestern China, um, at the Mogao Caves. Um, and these are a set of over 500 caves that are carved into the cliffs above a river. And these caves have some of the greatest achievements in uh, Buddhist art. And these caves are super, super old, starting from the 4th century all the way to the 14th century. And after the 14th century, um, these caves widely went out of um, disuse, but have since uh, become a UNESCO World Heritage Site and now attract uh, thousands uh, of visitors each year. And this is these caves are also um, sometimes referred to as the Cave of the Thousand Buddhas, Qianfu Dong, um, and it was inspired by the first monk who arrived at this cliff face and had a vision on this cliff and saw a thousand radiant Buddhas, um, which inspired him to um, start sort of digging out the first cave. So as you can probably tell from these stories, this is such a spiritually rich place. Um, and one sort of has to wonder how pieces of it ended up at the Harvard Art Museum. These are examples of what the Harvard Art Museum holds of these caves, um, cave fragments. So these are all busts or sort of fragments of a larger mural that would have been on the inside of painted on the inside of these caves. Um, and they these depict um, various bodhisattvas, which are sort of goddesses, half, half human, half godlike figures in Buddhism. Here's another fragment of a mural. And this is an object that the museum owns that is not on display. Um, and you can probably see why it's in not very good condition. And sort of looking at all of these different examples of fragments, one sort of has to wonder at, first of all, why are they in pieces? Um, and second of all, why is there such a range in the condition that they're in? And maybe this 
we'll kind of get this photograph will kind of give you an idea of why we're seeing these fragments in the state that they're in in the museums. So I'll give you a look, sort of look at what these caves look like if we were in Dunhuang ourselves. You enter the cave, go around the corner, and you're in this sort of immersive, deeply spiritual room, and you're just surrounded by these goddesses and Buddhist figures. And also, this cave in particular has the famous um, 1000 Buddha motif. As you can see, all of the Buddhas on the ceiling are all individually painted. So you can just see the amount of craftsmanship and work that would go into these rooms and how just amazing it would be to stand inside. Um, but Harvard's story starts with this wall. You can see there's this whole scene that's going on um, and it tells a larger um, story that I will get into. But as you can see, there's this just sort of strange hole, I guess you could say, that's floating in the middle of this wall. And that's kind of where Harvard's story comes into play. So our story starts with this man. Um, and some of you might kind of find him familiar, looking at his hat and kind of debonair look. Um, some of you might be reminded of Indiana Jones. And that's definitely an instinct that you should follow up on because this Harvard man actually inspired um, Indiana Jones. His name is Langdon Warner, and he was the Harvard professor of Chinese art um, back in the early 1900s. And in 1924, he traveled all the way to Dunhuang to the Mogao Caves to quote unquote retrieve frescoes on behalf of the Harvard Fog Museum, which today is now part of the Harvard Art Museums and he was assisted by a Taoist priest uh, named Wang Yuanlu, who ordained himself sort of the caretaker of these caves and ended up facilitating the, the selling and purchase of many different fragments and priceless scrolls, uh, which were purchased by various Western scholars um, in England as well as France. So people kind of, immediately start to question the motives of both of these figures, um, the Taoist priest, Taoist Wong, and Langdon Warner. Warner and Wong would probably themselves say that their motives were noble and they were almost rescuing these fragments. And other would, others would say that their motives were much more pernicious and sort of selfish. And I'm going to read you a quote of um, what, how sort of Langdon Warner gives his sort of reason as to why he went on this expedition um, and why he wanted to collect these fragments for the Harvard Art Museums. So he says, neither chemist nor trained picture restorer, but an ordinary person with an active archaeological conscience, what I was about to do seemed both sacrilegious and impossible. So Right off the bat, you can kind of see Warner himself as an archaeologist sort of struggling to come to terms with what he was doing, which essentially was sort of in destroying bits and pieces of the site. Um, but he would say this was in order to save these fragments. If we're thinking about uh, the context of China at the time, China itself was going undergoing a time of pol political turmoil. Um, and these caves, which were widely being unused um, after the October Revolution, which happened in Russia, the caves were actually being used by Russian soldiers to house um, as like sort of campsites for the Russian soldiers. And the soldiers were doing graffiti on the walls and were lighting fires inside of the caves and blowing smoke. Um, so you can see sort of the precarious state that the fragments were in during that time. Yeah, it's so 
it's so interesting that you bring up this logic of trying to save the objects. I mean, we see that with the Parthenon marbles. We see that with some of the objects we'll be looking at later on as well. But it, it also raises the question, which I'm sure you're going to talk about too. I mean, these these are there's incredible damage to both the caves themselves and then the fragments that are removed by taking them off of the wall. We can see this big kind of gaping hole, and then the fragments themselves are inevitably going to suffer. So, is it really saving? something to think about. Yeah, um, and maybe to give you an idea of like how these holes sort of happened and what steps Warner took to remove these fragments, he used a process that was usually used to um, remove Western frescoes, so oil, often oil-based pigments from the wall. He used a sort of chemical mixture of glue and um, strips of fabric and sort of puts a layer of glue on the fresco itself and then puts layers of fabric and sort of literally just peels whatever he put the a fixture to off of the wall. It actually, if done properly, this does remove it pretty well, but Warner put on a layer that was way too thick and also like the weather conditions were not right for the glue itself. So he ended up um, not removing the pigment fully. As you can see, there's like little pieces of pigment that weren't picked up, um, which resulted in fragments like this, which we don't see in the museums because, I mean, you can tell from the title, um, head and shoulders of a Buddhist figure. There's no way to identify like what this figure, figure was, where, what it re represented. Um, so it's essentially useless um, to the Harvard Art Museums now. These examples kind of make you ask, like, what was the point of this? And were we really causing more good than bad um, if we were not taking the right measures to remove these objects in the first place? And like, what it, what happens when we ended when when we end up making stuff like this? Oh, and this is a photograph of or a reconstruction of what the site would look like if we sort of put the fragment back into this story and this this whole um, wall tells the story of how um, Buddhism first um, arrived in China um, and it tells the story of this statue of the Buddha which um, was floating in the river and when it reached the shores of a, um, a Taoist village, it, the weather conditions became really bad. Um, but once it reached um, another shore, it was welcomed with open arms and the weather conditions became very, very, very favorable. So it's kind of interesting that Langdon Warner decided to take the piece that actually featured sort of like the main character of the story. Yeah, and also, I mean, it's it's ironic that this pe this work of art, this fragment of the fresco, has been taken out of its original context and transported around the world, and it itself shows a work of art kind of traveling in another sense. So, in that yeah. sense, you know, we get the idea that this is not exactly a new practice, and certainly sometimes museums even reference the fact that people have been taking art from other places for centuries as kind of a defense of they're of doing that now. Yeah, um, so why don't we move on to Paul's example? Yeah, so to kind of tie in with what Caitlin was talking about too, with the caves, we're, we're actually lucky that we know where that work of art originally came from, even if it's since been separated. But a lot of the time in museums with some of the objects on display, we don't even have that privilege. So the art market has historically been very linked with looting and objects have been taken from archaeological sites because they've been seen to have some sort of aesthetic value and then sold off to collectors or museums, but gradually they often make their way into museums. And this is something that there's been a lot of international debate about. There's been some major efforts to try to curb this, most notably in 1970 with a major UNESCO convention. And today, most major museums in countries like the United States will not buy things that they suspect were looted. And usually you can tell something was probably looted because you 
there's no information available on where it came from. But even so, looting continues to be a problem. And just to kind of illustrate why that is an issue, um, sure, it's nice that we have objects like this beautiful sarcophagus that show up in museums like the Harvard Art Museums. But since we don't know where a piece like this originally came from, we lose a lot of information that we could get from it. We lose the information that comes with archaeological context. We don't have any of the inscriptions that would have originally been with this sarcophagus. We don't even know what part of the world it was in. It's a Roman piece, but it was probably exported somewhere pretty far away from where it was made. So if we had that information, if we could find it on the original site, we could learn something about trade. We could learn something about the status of the person who owned this. But without that, we were left to just making speculations based on the object itself. And there's still things we can learn. We can figure out where this was carved. It was probably carved in Athens based on this particular style here. So not all the information is lost, but a lot is. And so we have to think about that loss of information when we, when we look at objects like this in a museum and the, the process of looting that has historically brought objects like this into museums. Yeah, so, because I feel like we've been talking a lot about like what we've lost um, but maybe thinking about what we, even even saying from like a personal standpoint, what we as Harvard students have gained and sort of thinking through sort of our own privilege um, and our own benefit from having sort of these objects that come from like these faraway places at our disposal. Um, I know from like the classes that I've taken, Professor Wong, who's the um, Chinese art professor at um, Harvard, um, is really torn because he his um, his research very much focuses on the Dunhuang caves and the Mogao caves. Um, so the fact that there's fragments of them right across the street makes it really convenient to use them as teaching materials and use them for his own research. And there's a lot of things that we can learn from these fragments, such as the pigments that were used. And you can even trace sort of the minerals that were used in these pigments and how these minerals got from distant places to China. Um, the Donghong Caves were located on the Silk Road. So this really was a mixing pot of different cultures and different trade routes coming together literally and figuratively and you can see that in the design and the styles that you see on the fragments and that sort of begs the bigger question of cultural heritage some people would say that it's obvious that the chinese should have these fragments back because it's their heritage, but others would argue that the Mogao Caves was the sort of pinnacle example of a common heritage and that the Han Chinese government is just, that's just the political heritage or that's just the political identity of these fragments. But if you sort of look at what's literally on the walls themselves, it tells this much more complicated story of this sort of common heritage and or different cultures coming together. So, I mean, at the site itself, um, there were numerous scrolls found um, that contained Confucian, Taoist, as well as Christian texts. The languages were Chinese, Sanskrit, Tibetan, and, old, and even Old Turkish. So there's so many things happening to say that one culture has a Ha can stake a claim over it in some way would be sort of overlooking um, the other cultures that contributed to the culture that we're talking about in of itself. So people would say that we should strive for sort of a universal or common heritage where one person's history is not more their history than anyone else's history. And maybe our own Harvard Art Museums might say the same, like, any encyclopedic museum um, is saying that they are a site of world heritage or common heritage and visiting whether you visit a museum in like Europe or in the US would be 
a way of visiting all these cultures at once and feeling more together because of that maybe right no i love that you make that point i mean while there are all these real ethical considerations especially if we're thinking about looting at the end of the day having this object like something like the cave paintings or the the sarcophagus at the harvard art museums it, it's been an incredible part of our education on campus and it's also open to the public so in some way it's it's useful to the entire community and so it's definitely something to think about uh, and actually, I like that you mention all of the kind of different cultural influences with this example. I think that ties really well into the Palmyran reliefs. So another really interesting set of objects in the Harvard Art Museums that speaks to some of these issues is these funerary reliefs from the ancient city of Palmyra. Uh, Palmyra was positioned in what is now modern day Syria. It was at one point part of the Roman Empire, and so it was kind of on the eastern edge of that empire at a meeting place between uh, basically what in ancient times was the eastern world and the western world and a lot of trade came through here and so it became a pretty wealthy city and they're actually known for this kind of carving this funerary relief that looks kind of funky you have these figures emerging out from the stone behind them but to go back to your point Caitlin about how sometimes you see different cultural influences in art here we see some really interesting things going on. If you look at these sculptures closely, there's definitely some resemblances to Greek and Roman sculpture. And if you weren't familiar with Palmyra, that might be what you would immediately associate these with. But at the same time, we see these more local influences. The clothing that they are wearing does look kind of Greco-Roman, but it also has Palmyran elements. Actually, if you look at the text behind them, it's in Aramaic, so it's not in Greek or Latin. And so there's this kind of fusion going on here of different styles of different cultures. And so by that logic, continuing that kind of fusion of cultures and intermixing, maybe it makes sense that they're in a modern museum like the Harvard Art Museums. And these pieces like the sarcophagus were also acquired decades ago, basically through different channels in the art market. Probably they're both unprovenanced, meaning we don't know exactly where they came from, but we, we do know here based on the style that they would have been at Palmyra. Uh, again, some contextual information is lost though. So you wouldn't really get the sense from seeing these in the gallery, how they would be set up at the site. So Palmyran funerary reliefs, of which there are quite a few that have been distributed across the world, would stand in these really interesting tower tombs these large kind of vertical brick structures that would house a lot of different bodies. And it's a pretty unique practice. You might not get that idea if you just see it in the gallery. But uh, these Palmyran sculptures also raise another issue, thinking back to sarcophagus and how looting some often results in not only a loss of information about context, but destruction of archaeological sites. Sometimes the politics of acquisition get even more complicated when we see things that come from sites that have not just been destroyed by looting, but been destroyed more overtly. So, so Palmyra is a World Heritage Site, much like many of the other sites we're talking about today. But in 2015 and 2017, uh, the whole international community was horrified to find out that ISIS had occupied the site had actually executed the site's director who had been there for many decades and blown up many of the major structures there, including some famous temples and some of the, te the, the tombs that we were just looking at. And so pieces like those funerary reliefs, although not those specific examples, started to make their way into the international art market and be sold off. In fact, ISIS would even issue permits to looters to take this material from the site and sell it internationally. And that kind of raises the question, in a circumstance like that, is it better to buy those objects? Is that somehow protecting them or salvaging what little remains of the site you still can? It's a very complicated issue. At the same time, you have to consider, well, the money you're even paying for that might eventually make its way back to fund more horrific acts like this. So again, that, that question of kind of protecting the past takes on an even new dimension. And by most international laws and agreements, this stuff should not be acquired. But again, just thinking about how the past can be politicized, how this stuff coming into a museum can have these really complex meanings. And even our reliefs, which were taken out of the site many years ago, 
perhaps someone could look at those and say, well, it's good that these made it to the US and got to Harvard when they did, because otherwise they might have been destroyed. So I, another kind of dimension of the, the debate around these palm iron reliefs too, as we, we saw is that without this context and the way they're displayed in the museums, just kind of standing on a wall, again, you don't get the sense of the entire original ensemble where they would have been. And I think that kind of ties into our next object where again, we'll see that um, it is often great to have things like this in a museum, but often when you visit the museum, you don't necessarily get that full picture. Yeah, so our next object takes us all the way to Mono, Liberia in Africa. Um, and what we're looking at is a mask um, from Liberia or the Mono tribe of Liberia. Um, and if we look, and, and this object is actually not owned by the Harvard Art Museums. It's actually owned by the Harvard Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. So um, we, we can also talk about sort of why that distinction exists and what that sort of means that this object was borrowed from the Anthropology Museum and moved to the Harvard Art Museums for the specific exhibition that it was placed in, which was an exhibition on um, clay in Africa. So some background on this mask. It is a chief mask that was worn uh, primarily during initiation or puberty initiation ceremonies um, for that the Mono people took part in. That was part of their tradition. Um, and this sort of initiation ceremony um, involves scarification and circumcision of, of a, um, a boy that was coming of age. This particular mask was also worn for more solemn occasions, um, such as the death of a leader. And when unused, these masks were often to be maintained in very hidden places um, and where they would be passed on from generation to generation uh, throughout the different generations of the tribe. And like Paul was talking about um, how this mask would ordinarily be sort of worn or presented, um, would, it would actually be worn by the chief um, and it would be sort of adorned with um, these different feathers and shells and textiles and sort of this straw that sort of hangs off of the rest of the costume. So this mask was worn by a very important figure that, and this figure was seen as sort of the communicator between the tribe and the forest. So as you can see, like if this person was wearing not only this mask, but this whole sort of regalia, uh, it's this really spiritual moment. And you can see this person decked out as sort of this like mythical being that is very much connected to the nature and the power of each material that is being used in this whole sort of setup. But when we look at this mask, just in isolation, and even looking at the way that it was displayed in the museum for a clay exhibition, um, it's a, you get a totally different feel of this object. Um, but because of that, you also see a lot of different things. Like most people wouldn't notice that the eyes, like the rimmed eyes, are what is made out of clay. And you can sort of see the, like, the amount of sculpting that went into this object in of itself, like how it was carved out of one piece of wood, um, which is just incredible. And also looking at the different materials that were used, um, red felt on the lips, um, the teeth of a chimpanzee on, as the actual teeth of the mask and the beads and the hair on the, or the fabric on the braids um, of like, I guess it's sort of like a beard. So, I mean, it's just like a beautiful piece, but again, you have to ask like, how did it get here? And what does it mean for such an important ritual object to be displayed in an art museum or a gallery? Um, and our story um, starts again back in 1926. So 
the Mo it's interesting to think about how the Mogao Cave expedition with um Langdon Warner happened in 1924 and in 1926 uh, George Way Harley a medical doctor from the United States um, on a project from the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology um, traveled all the way to Liberia where he there collected over 310 of these masks and these masks were sold during a time of very much political and cultural transition. So as Paul kind of pointed out, like it's interesting how all of these sort of exchanges happen when the country in question is undergoing a, a period of mass transition or even a period of violence and sort of disarray. So these villages were suddenly under immense pressure from the Liberian government at the time to pay this new instated tax and also a period of very much generational transition where um, the younger generations were not as interested in up the upkeep that these masks required and like because the these scar these um puberty ritual or pu puberty initiation ceremonies were very taxing and it, it involved sort of this whole process where like the boys would have to be isolated from like the rest of the tribe for like a very long time. And, and they would have to undergo all these like really physically rigorous processes. And this was a time where um, Western ideals and Western materials were kind of entering Liberia at the time. And the younger generations were interested in sort of the more Western way of life than their old traditions than upkeeping their old traditions. Um, the old traditions also often included um, like human sacrifice. Um, and that just increasingly didn't seem to line up with the Western ideals that were slowly trickling into the country. So George Way Harley enters and ends up buying these masks. And these masks were often sold in secret because the younger people didn't want the older people to find out that they were selling these sacred objects um, and people were trying to get rid of them so they could get cash to pay their taxes or just cash to have on hand to buy the things that they wanted to buy which were often western garments or materials and and just going back to so now george harley has what 310 of these masks and brings them back to Harvard and sort of the question of like now what do we do with them it's interesting to point out that these masks are ordinarily hidden or kept hidden so to sort of display them in the museum um, is sort of going against their initial purpose so as a result these masks are often not on display so there's over 310 of them and I've only been able to find a very few examples of them existing outside of um, the Peabody storage. But as a result of um, the two curators, their decision to include this mask in the exhibition um, and just talking and thinking back at all the aesthetic things that we were able to sort of gain from looking at the mask, it, it really is like a question of lesser evils. Like if we're Culture, very culturally sensitive and very much in line with the old traditions that these masks held, we would not be seeing them. Um, but sort of what's the good of them sitting in storage? Um, hard to say. Right. Well, it's interesting to me that both these masks and then those cave fragments too are acquired around the same time. Uh, and like you said, that's certainly no coincidence. It has to do with the very imperialistic history of disciplines like archaeology and anthropology. And that same kind of colonial past also relates to the fact that this, as you mentioned, is in the Peabody Museum and not actually in the Harvard Art Museum's collections, even though it's displayed there. So when we think about issues about acquisition, too, we might want to think what is not being displayed. Certainly the Harvard Art Museums has very few objects in its collections that are from 
African artists or from Native American artists or Latin American artists. So that's something to think about as well. Certainly having this exhibition in the Harvard Art Museums is beneficial in some ways because it's a move in the right direction to have more kinds of art from other cultures on display uh, instead of just this kind of Eurocentric focused narrative. So yeah, or maybe one thing to think about also is like what interested uh, um, George Harley in these masks in the first place um, and sort of the later scholarship that has been done on these masks. So um, George Harley initially wanted to um, investigate this society called the Poro Society, which is a secret society that um, like men or boys had to be initiated into. And also um, later scholarship that was done on these masks, there was one book that talked about how these masks would often be smeared with blood um, of like whatever sacrifice occurred. Um, so as you can see, sort of the studies that have been done on these objects are sort of tinged with the sort of exoticizing, um, like primitive sort of study of these objects um, and like all of the sort of assumptions that go into these kind of studies. So I hope everyone learned a lot from this session. Um, we've only covered three objects and tried to cover three different regions, um, but there are so many examples from so many other different places. And so we hope next time that you visit a museum, as much as you're enjoying what you are seeing, uh, try to think about what you're not seeing and what stories are not being told um, and which, which nations are represented in this the art museum in which nations are represented in other kinds of museums that will also give you a really interesting sense of like which ob which cultures do we think are capable of making art and which we assume are not for some reason so thank you everybody for joining us uh, again there's so much we could talk about here so we tried to jam everything we could into this short session but something to keep thinking about in the future for sure. So.